All right, all right. Will you turn with me this morning to Psalm chapter 7? Psalm chapter 7. We're going to finish um, Summer in the Psalms today, and I hope it was an encouragement to you. I hope it was comforting to you. I hope that uh, through this series that God just really um, uh, spoke to you through his word and really you were able to see God for who he is. And again, just the Psalms are just so comforting. They really are. And again, uh, I just want to really say, I know I said it already, but I want to say it again. I, uh, I really genuinely missed uh, being here um, for the last three weeks. Maybe two, maybe two, maybe two weeks. The, the, fir- the first week uh, I was on vacation. And so, um, thank you. I was in California, I get to Phoenix, and it's hot, man. I'm just, I need water. It's so hot. But, um, so yeah, I, I really genuinely miss being here with you guys. Um, two weeks just seemed like forever, and I'm just glad I'm back. I really am. Um, so first week that I missed, uh, my family and I took a vacation. It was great. Uh, it's definitely different traveling, uh, just you and your wife, and then you and your wife and a baby. It's a lot different, uh, but it was great either way. Uh, then the last two weeks, I was in California. Uh, I was in school for two weeks. Um, and uh, I'm currently, as I, I think I let you guys know a little bit, about a year ago actually now, uh, I am in the Doctor of Ministry program at the Master's Seminary, uh, pursuing a degree in expository preaching. And so I have a year and a half left. And so if my preaching doesn't get better after three years, there's no hope for me. I mean, you're just stuck. I mean, that's it. That's it. Um, but, uh, but I tell you that just... Just to keep me in prayer throughout uh, this year and a half, uh, I have a good solid year of of class, and then I have a a whole maybe like six months of a a project, a final project that's that's due. Um, But the whole goal, as I told you guys the very first time that uh, I kind of announced where I was, what I was doing, is I just want to be able to feed you week in, week out. That's really the goal of me going to school. I want to be faithful to the text. I want to be a good expositor of God's word, and I just want to uh, feed you both milk for the new believers and meat for those of us who are along the way. And I just want to be faithful. Uh, So pray as I uh, have papers and tons of reading throughout the semester. And I'll fill you in as as I go. Uh, But again, thank you so much for allowing me uh, to to step away two weeks from the pulpit. And um, again, uh, just thank you so much for your support. I know a lot of you guys pray. And uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, So thank you. So I want to I want to jump I want to jump right in. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. There's a lot of I've been gone for three weeks. There's a lot of announcements. Okay, a lot I got I got to tell you. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna end Psalms today. We're gonna once summer comes around next summer, uh, we're gonna pick it up, chapter eight, and we're just gonna keep going until we're done. Uh, so let me give you kind of the the plan for the fall in August. What we're doing. So um, August sixth, uh, we start a brand new series in the book of Jude. And so that's going to be a four-part series. Jude is such a good book. If you've never read Jude, it's such a good book. Uh, So we'll be there for a month. And then starting September, I think the second week of September, uh, we're going to start tackling Mount Everest. And uh, that's Romans. And we're going to be in Romans uh, for a very long time. But I'm telling you, it is so rich. It is so good. I believe God's going to really uh, encourage you and strengthen you in your faith. But I'll tell you this too, Romans is a very challenging book and it's also going to challenge you theologically and biblically. So I'm really excited about that. So that's where we're headed. Uh, how long is it going to take us to do Romans? A long time, but I'm so excited about it. So that's the plan. But anyway, Psalm chapter seven, Psalm chapter seven. I, uh, I want to begin by asking you a question. I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Have you ever been falsely accused of something? It could have been something very small and maybe it didn't have a lot of repercussions or implications, or maybe it was something major and it had some very serious implications for your life. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? And I'm talking about like something you really didn't do. Not like one of those things, well, I don't know, you know, trying to justify. No, you know for sure you didn't do what they're, they were accusing you of. I remember when uh, I was in high school, uh, I was, uh, I think it was science class. I was a senior in high school and uh, we were taking a test. 
and I got up to go sharpen my pencil. And on the way back, me being the class clown joker that I was, I wasn't saved yet, okay? So don't be judging me, I wasn't saved yet. And, uh, but I was just messing with people along the way and I was just being a jokester. And so right when I was joking with one of my friends, uh, the teacher looked up and he thought I was cheating. And I, I, again, I, I was not cheating. I was I messing around, absolutely guilty. But I was not cheating. I was just messing around. He said, he said Johnny, you know, you're cheating, blah, blah, You know, go, go to the principal's office. And, and I'm sitting there in class arguing with my science teacher. Just because, man, when I know I didn't do something, I didn't do it, right? Anyone like that? I just know I didn't do it. Don't be accusing me. And so we are in this, like, shouting match in, in, the, in the middle of class. And he said, he fought, like, go to, the, go to the principal's office. I said, okay. So I grab my backpack and I leave the classroom. Did I go to the principal's office? Of course not. I, mean, I was innocent. I did not cheat. I'm not going to go to the principal's office. Nothing ever came about that. I don't know what happened. He forgot about it or whatever. But I did not do it. Now, I know I didn't handle that situation right. I just, I didn't. The question is then, how do we handle, though, being falsely accused? Maybe not over, or really, it could be something small or something big. I know mine was kind of trivial when I was a teenager. But how do we handle that? How do we handle in a biblical God-honoring way when we're falsely accused of something? Should we take revenge, right? Uh, try to get revenge on that person, get them back, Whatever you did to me, I'm going to do to you and even worse. Well, I don't think that's a good situation, or I don't think that's a good answer, right? Why? Because it adds more fuel to the fire, and a lot of the times we actually hurt the other person a lot more than they hurt us. Should we defend ourselves, right, if we're being falsely accused? Well, I've kind of learned over time that that's probably not even a good idea either, because the more we defend ourselves, the guiltier we look, don't we? So I don't think that's even the best way to do it. So how then do we handle or think through when we're falsely accused? And again, maybe this might hit home for you. Maybe you have been falsely accused. Maybe you're currently uh, being falsely accused. Or here's the thing, maybe you haven't. And that's good, and I hope it stays that way. But don't be surprised if one day you are. Right? That's just life, whether small, a small accusation or a big accusation. But, and so whether we have been or currently being falsely accused or will be, I think this is going to be helpful for all of us in Psalm chapter 7. So again, will you take your Bibles? Let's read the passage this morning, Psalm of David. It says this, O Lord, my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. O oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O oh Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts. O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and, and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. That is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. 
God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that it just touches on, especially the Psalms, they just touch on every aspect and every um, part of our lives. Uh, I pray, God, that if anyone has been falsely accused and is kind of still hurting through that, that you would encourage them with this passage. God, I pray for those who um, are currently being accused of something, whether minor or major, I pray that you would also comfort them, and I pray that you would give those of us who are yet to be falsely accused, give us wisdom and discernment on how to handle these types of situations uh, with your word. God, pray you would speak to each and every one of us today uh, through your word. God, speak to us clearly. We are open and ready to hear from you, God. We love you. We honor you. And God's people said, amen. So how do we handle this um, this false accusations if in our, in our lives. Uh, here, David, in this Psalm, Psalm 7, uh, we don't really know the exact occasion uh, that David is writing about, but we do know that there was a guy by the name of Cush who was a Benjamite who is really falsely accusing David. That's all we know. We don't know any of the specifics, um, but he is falsely accusing David, and we'll get to that in just a bit. So that's what we know. So what I want to do this morning is give you five ways on how to handle uh, false accusation from the text, and I hope they're helpful. And I'm going to do that by using five words to kind of help us really kind of hang our, he- our hats on the, on the text, really help us with the structure of the text. But I want to give you five words on how to handle false accusations. And the first is refuge. We're to take refuge in the Lord when we're falsely accused. Uh, look back with me at verse 1 and 2. It says, O Lord, my God, In you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rendering it in pieces with none to deliver. And so here, David is is calling out to the Lord. Uh, He is... In 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 in, uh, in in tremendous agony, right? Because he's being falsely accused, but he's going to the Lord. He's taking refuge in God Himself. The word refuge here has is, has the idea of taking shelter or hiding oneself, as if you know you're in Florida and there's a hurricane. You're taking shelter. You're looking for safety, and so David is sheltering under the wings and the protection of the Lord from those who are falsely accusing him, from those who are slandering him and criticizing him and wanting to tear him apart like a lion tearing up a gazelle. And so he goes to God for protection, for refuge. God is his refuge. And we've seen this already previously in the Psalms throughout this series. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, David says, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm chapter 5, verse 11, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. And so, man, David, whenever he encountered a very difficult situation when he was caught in the storm. He automatically went to the Lord to take refuge. And I think that's a lesson for us as well. Is he the first one where we go to? Is he our refuge in the times of difficulty and pain and conflict? And and notice this. Notice that David says that, God, they're, they're metaphorically, like they're trying to Tear me up like a lion. If they get a hold of me, they're going to rip me apart to shreds. Now, David, if you know anything about David, uh, he was very familiar with lions, right? Wasn't he? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, 34 and 35, it says this. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, what did David do? I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. I mean, David killed lions and bears and he went after them. I don't think there's anyone in here that would go after a lion or a bear, right? If you do, you have some amazing faith because I'd be running 
But isn't it interesting, though? I think this is so interesting that David is asking the Lord to save him from his lion like slanders. But when he came across a real lion, he went after it. Isn't that interesting? That David here is in agony over the words that other people are speaking about him. But yet when it came to a real lion, he had absolutely no problem of tearing the lion apart. Why is that? Here's why. Because words are powerful. And words hurt. And words create damage. And words can start a wild fire if we don't control them. They hurt. And they hurt especially to someone like David, don't they? David was the king. A lot of responsibility on his plate. I think the more responsibility and the higher the stakes, the more it hurts. And so this was a very serious matter to David. Do you remember that old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Remember that? That is so false, man. Words hurt. Words hurt. They are so painful, and that's something that we can never take back. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said this about this very passage. He said this, Verily, This is not an overdrawn picture. He's saying that that David is not exaggerating here, but this is what he says. He says, for the wounds of a sword will heal, but the wounds of the tongue cut deeper than the flesh and are not soon cured. Our words are powerful, especially when they're spoken against us. So, What would you do? What would you do if you're being falsely accused? And you know for sure that you are innocent. Would you take revenge or would you seek refuge? Uh, Would you try to take things, take matters into your own hands or would you deliver everything over to the Lord? Would you defend yourself or would you let God defend you? I want to encourage you this morning, church, to take refuge in the Lord. Don't take matters into your own hands. That's when things get out of hand. But let me remind you of a very comforting passage in Romans chapter 12. It says this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Don't take revenge, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if anything, he says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hey, don't take revenge. Kill him with kindness, genuine kindness and genuine love. That's what he's saying there. So number one, we take refuge. Number two, we reflect. We reflect. Look at verse three. Through five. Oh Lord, my God, if I have done this, if I've done this, right? If there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Here we see David saying, Okay, God, if I have done this, if, if I've truly done what they are accusing me of, then okay, let my enemies have their way. Let my enemies have their way. If I've really done this, and so I really think what David's doing here is reflecting. David here is checking his heart to see if these accusations are really true. And I believe this is a sign of humility by David. He's not saying, you know what, Nothing they're saying is true. It's totally false. God, if I've done this, there's this kind of introspective um, uh, reflection of David. And I think that's a really good thing to pursue as well for us, to reflect, to be humble and say, God, did I really do this? 
And that's what David is doing. He's reflecting in humility. Now, this passage gives us an idea of what he's being accused of. Verse 4, if you look at verse 4 in your Bibles with me, it says, If I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause. So David was being falsely accused of betraying a friend or backstabbing a friend. They're calling him a backstabber. And he's also being accused of ripping off his enemies, using his kingly authority and kingly power, misusing his authority for his way, for his revenge, for his good. That's what he's being accused of. But again, we see him reflecting, if I have done this, if I have done this, if I have done this, then okay, God. I remember when I was uh, started in Bible college, I, I was in Bible college, and um, at that time, I was serving at my church, in my church's youth ministry. And uh, I remember uh, serving and loving on students and honestly doing my best um, to, to serve there. But like anyone in ministry, uh, criticism and false accusations, they're just going to be part of it. They're part of the job description if you've ever done ministry. And I remember I got my first criticism and accusation. And so I went to the pastor at that time and I said, Hey, uh, how, do, how do you handle this? Give me some wisdom, right? Like, give me some wisdom on, on how to handle this. And I remember him saying, Johnny, look, yes, what they're saying is false, but um, in everything, ask yourself this question. Is there a nugget of truth in what they're saying? Is there, is there something that they're saying that, that may be true? There is there something that you're just you're not seeing? Have have the humility to reflect and ask God to work in your heart and to show you if you are wrong. And man, that's been so helpful in my life as I reflect. God, is, did I do something wrong? Is is what they're saying? In, is there a nugget of truth in there that they're saying is true? And God, if there is, I repent of that sin. And I give it over to you. But I think that is super, super helpful to reflect, to ask God to search us. And that's what David does. David was a person who asked God to search him. In Psalm 139, I think this would be a good prayer for us. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David prays, search my heart, God. Search me, search my heart to see if there's any sin, any evil, any wrongdoing in my heart. And so church, I encourage you to pray that. Search me, God. Let's get real. Let's, 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 let's get at the heart level. Am I at fault? Did I do wrong? I encourage you to do that. Now, a lot of times it could be scary to pray that prayer, right? Search my heart. But I think it's also necessary to do that, even when we're not being falsely accused, on regularly to ask God, search me. I need a spiritual checkup of my heart, spiritual cleansing of the things that are in my heart. So number one, we take refuge in the Lord. We don't take revenge. Number two, we really reflect if there's a nugget of truth. And number three, request. We request God to vindicate us, and we request that God would give us justice. If truly after, because he, here's, here's what's going on even in, in the prior point. David is reflecting, and as he's reflecting, he's really coming to the conclusion that, no, I'm innocent, God. I'm, I'm, I'm completely innocent. And so David realizes that he's innocent. And now he's requesting that God would bring him justice. Verse 6 through 9. He says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over, uh, over it, run it on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and you have established the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. And so here we see David requesting that God would 
vindicate him, that God would give him justice. I mean, notice the powerful language here. Arise, lift up, awaken. So David is calling out to God that God would defend him, that God would give him justice against his false accusers and slanders. Now, notice what David says. I think it's very interesting. He says, judge them, right? And, O Lord, um, judge me as well according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Isn't that interesting? God, judge me according to my righteousness and my integrity. Now, I just want to explain briefly that David is not saying that he's sinless here that he's somehow self-righteous and fully righteous and perfect and holy. We know, and he knows, that that's not possible. What David is saying here is that he's innocent, not that he's sinless. God, I am innocent. I'm completely innocent, and so judge me based off my innocence. Yes, I'm not perfect, but God, in this situation, as they're falsely accusing me, I am innocent, and you know that, God. And so David, what he does, and his his basis for requesting justice is the character of God. Because look what he says. He says, you, God, who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. So David is requesting justice based off the character of God, of who he is. In other words, this is what David's saying. God, you see everything. God, you know everything. You know my heart. You know the heart of the slanders and the accusers. You know it all. And you know I'm innocent. So God, I want justice. I want earthly justice. That's what he's saying here. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, The Lord, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. God knows it all. Everything. All of our hearts. He's omniscient. You see, false accusers can fool people, but false accusers can't fool God. You cannot fool God at all. And so David, again, appeals to the character of God. Oh, righteous God. Genesis 18, 25 says, shall not the judge of the earth do what is just? God will always do what is just. He will always do what is right. So David prays. For justice, but David also prays for judgment, doesn't he? I mean, it's in the text. We can't run from it. Lift up yourself against the fury of my enemies, right? In your anger. And so I think Elder Greg, about two weeks ago, addressed what is called an imprecatory psalm. It's a psalm of judgment. It's a psalm where God's people call upon the Lord to have judgment on their enemies. Can we pray those prayers as New Testament believers? Again, if you haven't heard the sermon, go back. It's it's on Psalm 5, but I will say this, and I will agree with Greg, that yes, we can. As New Testament believers, we can pray imprecatory prayers of judgment upon our enemies. There are are in the New Testament, there are imprecatory prayers. Paul in Galatians says, hey, whoever brings you a new gospel, a different gospel, he should be what? A curse. Now, we do that, though, with tremendous care and humility and love. And the, for, the, the most important thing is not that God would give us justice and judgment. Yes, we want that. But most importantly, I think we want to see the salvation of those who falsely accuse us, don't we? And we do it out of love. We do it with humility. But yes, there are definitely times when we want justice. If something was grievously done to us, God, you have the justice. Give us justice. And I'll tell you this, God will give you justice, whether in this life or in the life to come, but he will give every single one of his children justice. And so that's what David prays here. He requests God for justice. He doesn't take matters into his hands, but he requests that God would vindicate him, defend him, and clear his name. Fourth, rest. We rest that God will vindicate us. We rest that God will bring judgment upon those who have accused us. Look at verse 10 through 16. It says, my shield is with God. 
who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword or sharpen his sword. He has bent and readied his bows. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrow, arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and he falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head and on his own skull. His violence descends. And so we can then rest assured, like I said earlier, that we will have justice, that God will come through for us, that God will, again, in this life or in the life to come, bring judgment upon those who have falsely accused us. A couple of things I want to point out, point out here that I just think we cannot escape. In verse 11, it says that God, he's a God who feels indignation every day. He feels indignation every day. The New Living Translation puts it this way. He is angry with the wicked every day. That God is angry with the wicked every single day. But Johnny, I thought, you, I thought God is a God of love. I, I thought God is a God of mercy and grace. Absolutely and amen. God loves all people and he's gracious in a common way, but also in, in a way, yes, God loves the wicked and the sinner and those who are not in Christ with a common grace, with a common type of love. But at the same time, he also hates the wicked. And notice what it says. It doesn't say he hates their sin or that he's angry with their sin. No, no, that he hates the wicked. He hates them with a fiery and fury. He hates them. Psalm 5, verse 5, again, Greg speaking, Greg spoke on this passage. Verse 5, Psalm 5, verse 5, you hate all evildoers. We can't run from that, folks. God hates the wicked. Everyone not in Christ. Everyone who hasn't bowed the knee to Christ. Everyone who's not a child of God. God hates. God will judge. Verse 12, though. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. If there's no repentance, genuine repentance... A repentance that leads to a changed life, not simply, oh, I'm sorry, God, but I'm going to go back to what I did before. No, a repentance that leads to transformation, a saving faith, a saving repentance. And God says, if a man doesn't repent, there's a sword ready, there's a bow, deadly weapons, and fiery arrows, judgment and wrath to come. But even in this passage, in this verse, do you see the hope that is in there in verse 12? Do you see the hope that's just calling out to you if you don't know Christ? Look at verse 12. If a man does not repent. If, keyword if, meaning that there's hope. Meaning that if you're not in Christ, that if you're wicked and evil, that if you've never surrendered to Christ, if you repent, there is still hope to truly repent, to truly bow the knee to Christ. God gives time to repent. Second Peter chapter 3, 9 through 10, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are, are done on it will be exposed. God is patiently waiting for you to come to him, for you to repent, for you to experience his love and his grace and his mercy. But I tell you today, if you are here this morning, you're watching online, God's grace will run out. There will come a time of judgment. God's grace will run out. So if you don't know Christ, 
if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never truly surrendered your entire life, all that you are, to come to Christ. Come to Christ. Place your faith in him, that it was his work on the cross that gave us life. Not our good deeds, not our good works. Come to him. There's nothing but judgment available for you if you do not turn. Turn and trust in Christ. You see, right now, like, sometimes we're more worried about whether we're going to go eat for lunch than worried about where we're going to spend eternity. Come to Christ. Give your life to him. He brings judgment on those who don't. There's hope if a man repents. So for, this, for those of us who are in Christ and in God, and we're being falsely accused, there's rest because God brings judgment on those who have accused us. Now, how does God do that? He does it in many ways, but I think there's one way here that God points out that I think is very interesting. Look what it says in verse uh, 15. He makes a pit. This is about the false accuser. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns on his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. In other ways, one of the ways that God judges those who falsely accuse us is let me put it this way, whatever goes around comes around. Proverbs puts it this way, Proverbs 26, 27, whoever digs a pit will fall into it and a stone will come back on him who starts rolling it. The false accusers who are digging a pit, creating evil for those who are in God, will get that in return. That's God's judgment. And I think that's a lesson for each and every one of us as well. If we're ever on the opposite side, when we're trying to harm someone, when we're trying to falsely accuse someone, don't be surprised if that boomerang's back at you. That's what this verse is saying. It's a boomerang. Those of you that are younger, you probably don't even know what that is. What's a boomerang? Is that like a new app? No, it's not. It's a toy. But that's what the text is saying. Jerome a fifth century church father says this, just as anyone who tosses a stone straight up into the air and is foolish enough not to move out of its way is struck on the head and wounded by his own stone. That is the judgment. That is the outcome of those who falsely accuse. You're going to get what you were trying to give. This, we see this in, in the life of Daniel. If you remember Daniel in the Old Testament, the governing officials of the day were super jealous, jealous of him. And they were creating a plan that led to uh, Daniel in the den, right? I mean, Daniel ends up in the lion's den and God saves him and, and shuts the mouth of the lion. And these governing officials were, they couldn't find fault in him and they were falsely accusing him. And they ended up uh, causing him to go to the lion's den. But look at Daniel 6, 24. This is what happened to them. And the king commanded, and those men who and those men who maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. So the men who maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the lions. And the very same thing they wanted for Daniel, that's what happened to them. And worse, let me read. They, their children, and their wives. So they got it even worse. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces. The very same thing that they wanted for Daniel, they got it worse. So believer, rest assured that whatever someone's trying to cause in your life will repel because of God's protection and God's shield and repel, repel back to them. Again, whether in this life or in the life to come. But God will vindicate you. God will give you justice, rest assured. And lastly, respond. 
respond with worship and praise. Look at verse 17. And we'll give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the most high. In this Psalm, I just want you to see that David begins with prayer. Oh Lord, save me. They're gonna rip me apart like a lion. God, I didn't do it. God, please give me justice. But how does he end? With praise. He ends with praise and the text doesn't really give us a solution. We don't know in this situation if David got vindicated, if David got the justice that he wanted. But even then, David praised God and worshiped God as he's being falsely accused. He doesn't have an answer yet. He doesn't have a decision from the Lord of how he's going to come through, yet he praises the Lord. And David praises the Lord and calls him the Most High. The Most High, the title for the Lord, the Most High, speaks of God's sovereignty over all of his creation. He worships the sovereign God who is in control of every single aspect of our lives. R.C. Sproul says, there are no maverick molecules in this universe. Psalm, Psalm 83, 18 says, that they may know that you alone, whose name is, I'm sorry, for you, O Lord, are the most high over all of the earth, not just part of the earth, over all of the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You're the most high over all of the earth. It speaks of God's sovereignty. And so he responds with, with worship. So if you have been falsely accused, if you're currently, or if you will be, remember that you can worship and praise in your pain, even if you don't have an answer. So how do we handle false accusation? We take refuge in the Lord. We reflect to see if there's a nugget of truth where we went wrong. We request God's justice and judgment upon those who accuse us. We rest assured that God will come through and we respond with worship. The last thing I wanna end is this way. Jesus himself was falsely accused. Don't be surprised when you are. Mark 14, 55 says, now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. They were falsely accusing Christ and he still went to the cross. Now, Jesus hanging on the cross, innocent, and not just only innocent, sinless, righteous and perfect and pure. What does he do? Does he try to defend himself on the cross? Does he try to take revenge even from the cross? Does he call upon the Father to send lightning bolts and just completely take everybody out? Because he could have. What does he do? First Peter chapter two, verse 23 and 24. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Entrust yourself to the one who judges justly. And look at verse 24. Why? Why did, why did Jesus go to the cross and not defend himself and try to get down from the cross? Why did he do that? This is so important. Verse 24. 
he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree to offer forgiveness, to offer salvation because he loved you and I. He didn't defend himself. He didn't plead his case, but he went to the cross for the forgiveness of sin. So again, if you do not know Christ, he did not come down from that cross for you, my friend. So come to him truthfully, finally, and genuinely. There's no time to waste. Today is the day of salvation. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Life is better with Christ, I'm telling you. Jesus changes everything. Come to him. And for those who are already believers, verse 24 has something for us as well. Look what it says. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. There's forgiveness. Listen closely. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. I just need to say that again. To die to sin and live for righteousness. Believer, Jesus did not come down from that cross because he wanted to save you, because he chose you before the foundation of the world to offer you forgiveness and salvation, not so that you can just live willy-nilly however you want, just like the world, but to live for righteousness and holiness sold out for God. Live for him. He didn't defend himself and, and come down just for nothing but that we might be holy and blameless and pursue holiness like him. Live for him. Pursue him with everything that you have. Give him your all. Surrender your heart, believer. Live for him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will come later. Let's pray. Oh God, we love you. We're so thankful for the example you set for us, Lord. That you didn't defend yourself. You didn't bring yourself from that cross because you could have. But you stayed there to give us forgiveness, to give us life, to give us hope, to give us freedom. You didn't revile back, you didn't retaliate, but you entrusted your life to the Father. And may we, by the grace of God, do the same. And you died for us, not so that we can look like the world, but so that we can reach the world. May you today, God, in every single genuine believer that's here, would you ignite a passion for you to live righteously, to live for your glory and to live for your honor so that when the world looks at us, they know, they know, they can see it, that there's something different. And that is you, Jesus. We love you, we honor you, we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. And amen.